Sir. What up, world? It's your boy DJ Toom, ATL Beat Banger. I just jumped off the porch with my man, Dirty Glove Bastard. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We right back at it, y'all. We got a legend on the porch today. The one and only mm -hmm. DJ Toon jumping off the porch with us. What's up, bro? What up, champ? How you doing, man? Man, I'm cool, bro. Everything's yeah, man, great. Glad to be here, man. Yes, you know, sir. I've been keeping up, you know, with every, you know, all the episodes and whatnot, man. Yeah, Congrats nah. on everything, That's too, what's up, man. bro. You're putting man. in work. It's an honor to have you here, bro. Hey, so, man. Thank you. Know you. What Thank what you. Mean? Thank it's you. an honor to have our work, you know what I mean, uh, to where you want to come and, and sit down and hey, you know, tell your story, man. Yeah, man. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yes, sir. Glad to be here, champ. That's what's up. That's what's up, man. So, so, Tom, man, you, you you from Atlanta, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, man. Southwest, man. man. Uh, Hugh Spaulding, baby, man. Huh, okay. Going to Hugh Spaulding Medical Center, dog, uh, right across from Grady Hospital. Okay, you know what I, mean? I can so, do yeah, it. yeah, Ben Hill slash Summer Hill. Yeah, yes, my sir. grandma stayed over there in Summer Hill, right across from the old Fulton County Stadium. Okay, Word. next by the, I don't know if you been, like, it's, it's an Azar, it used to be an Azar um, liquor store right there on the corner of Georgia Avenue, mm -hmm. right there. Yeah, man. Word. So, yeah, that's how. A little stumping ground right there, watching fireworks every Braves game and shit. Yeah, yeah man, I can dig it, man. So what's it been like, I mean, watching this legendary city just grow so much, you know, over the years to being, I mean, now, you know, the biggest uh, city when it comes to entertainment, music, film. I mean, even mm -hmm. technology is breaking out down here. It's beautiful, man, because, you know, Atlanta definitely had been known, you know, back in the late 60s and 70s. You know, a lot of the hustlers used to meet up down here, you know what I mean, from all over. You know, it was like when the, when the game was super strong as far as that whole heroin thing, man. And um, so Atlanta has always been big on, like, you know, underground activity, criminal activity, a lot of pimps, a lot of prostitution used to be, you know, down here too, up and down yeah. Auburn. And, you know, so a lot of the pimps used to migrate here, just players, period. So yeah. it was the closest thing to Vegas almost, you know what I mean? Only thing we missed was a casino, you yeah. know? So it's a few attributes that Atlanta, if we had that, I don't know if it would, would be corrupt by now or what. But like, you know, we don't have any beaches, no, no water, you right. know, no casinos and nothing like that, but it's still just a, a busy city that's been carrying on its own for so long. So now that the, um, the entertainment side, you know, that a lot of those big entities have moved here, Hell yeah, man! It's just, it's beautiful watching it, you know, change and go through its little changes and whatnot. So, Word. yeah, I'm just basically, basically staying afloat, trying to see where I can fit in, man. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? Word. So, so, I mean, when you was coming up, man, like, what type of cat was you, you know, coming up? Were you always like into music and into, hmm. you know, the arts or what? Man, I was all over the place, man. Like, you think about hip hop, period. Like, but first, I, I would say even before hip hop, I've been into music. Uh, my dad. You know, he's singing this group called the MVPs. Okay. So they were signed to Buddha Records. Mm -hmm. He was the lead singer. So watching them rehearse all the time in like the little den area in the house or whatnot. See, I eventually learned how to sing myself. You know what I mean? So you got to think in the 70s, you know, it, would, it wasn't no rap, no hip hop. Right. So if you wanted to be in the music business or any, do anything in music, you either had to play an instrument or sing. So I used to plot it, try to play the guitars a little bit. My dad used to keep little instruments around the house. But um, I caught myself dropping the needle, going to the turntables, you know, just listening to all those classic albums, you know, once he let me really start working the record player or whatnot. Yeah. But uh, I learned how to sing eventually too, though. Mm -hmm. By the age seven, man, I was doing harmony and everything. Like, right. I still play around to this day when I feel like it, you know. Yeah. And I want the women to come out their clothes in a smooth manner. Yeah. You know, yeah. I might sing to them and shit. Huh, so, yeah, you was just at, so, so you was at the house <laughs> messing with the record player, uh, uh, breaking the needles. Yeah, all that, so. man. Yeah, scratching the records. And that one pop was like, hey, man, you know, if you don't drop that needle right on that record, man, you know, don't even touch it no more. So yeah. I got good at the needle drop. Not knowing that that was gonna play a part of me DJing later on, right, you know what I mean? right, right. So, and see, I was gonna ask, were you in there like trying to scratch too? Were you doing any of that? That of didn't start until I saw Grandmaster Flash on 60 Minutes, and they were talking about the movie Wild Style. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if y'all remember that movie. It's like one of those hip hop classics. It was before oh, yeah. Beat Street, Breaking, sure. and all that Wild Style. It was Fat Five Freddy and Lady Blondie. Mm -hmm. I don't know if y'all remember that song Rapture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So um, they was like, like the main characters in that movie. But um, when 60 Minutes was talking about it, they was just talking about the whole birth of hip hop. And it was like in 82. Okay. And they showed Grandmaster Flash on his turntables, had him set up in the kitchen and whatnot. 
And I was listening to, you know, a lot of hip hop back then. And I remember it was a song on the back of one of those Grandmaster uh, Flash and the Furious Five records called Grandmaster Flash on the Wheels of Steel. I really didn't know what Wheels of Steel meant until later on, like, oh, those are the turntables. And that's that one where he's like, you say, you say, you say, one for the trouble, two for the time. Yeah. You remember that? Uh-huh. And, <clears throat> And I realized I used to hear this little rubbing sound, but I didn't know that he was scratching the record. Yeah. Like, poof, 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 poof. and then when I saw him doing it on that 60 Minutes little clip, I was like, oh my God, I think I want to do that. Huh. I was locked in. And yeah. I started going to Jelly Bean Skate Rink at an early age, too, man. I'm, I was one of them kids who used to hang around the folks that was like five years older than Word. me. You know what I mean? Yeah. So there's a lot of shit I caught on to early, bro. You yeah. know, the good and the bad. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, now I heard you just mention the skating ring, man. Can you talk about, you know, like the skating culture, like in Atlanta and what? how big that was, you know, back in the day? Man, and it's sad that you got to say was, because I wish it still was. Yeah. You know, Cascade still got their thing, yeah, but it just be- wasn't where it was in the 80s. Mm-hmm. Man, well, that was my first taste of the nightlife, for real. And, um, and at one point, at, uh, it used to be Greenbrier Skating Ring because oh. it was right up the street on Stone Road off Faraburn, mm-hmm. up the street from Greenbrier uh, Mall. So it was Greenbrier Skating Ring, and then they changed it to Jelly Beans. And um, man, it was just a place to be on Saturday and Sunday night, bro. Um, from the age age range, went from what, from 10 to maybe 30, mm-hmm. maybe 40. You know, you had a lot of older people out there skating. It was this old guy, and we just called him Pops, man. He used to always be out there in the yeah. ring, you know what I mean? He was, and you got to think now, back in the 80s, this guy was already like 60 something years old oh, wow. skating out there with us. Yeah. yeah, we just called him Pops, man. Real solid guy. I don't think he's here now, unless he's it's a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? But, um, but that was like uh, the first taste of, you know, the whole thing, man. I like, grew up fast, dude. You know, I used to hear people talking about Reefa. Yeah. You know, next thing you know, I'm like, oh, that's what that is? Oh, my dad be smoking that. Huh. Oh, okay. I smelled that in the house, but I didn't know that was called reefer. Yeah. So that, first time seeing people in the corner, tongue kissing. Huh. Um, my first time meeting a girl and holding hands, skating. So it's, that shit broke, cracked everybody's egg. Everybody's yeah. cherry got broke at the skate ring. You yeah. know what I mean? Word. First time slow dancing. You know, of course, you know, you do got house parties and whatnot. But mm-hmm. at Jelly Beans, man, like that was just our first taste, taste of the nightlife before we turned 21, was able to really get in real clubs. Okay but we were still able to see what grown folks were doing. Yeah. And, um, and that Jelly Beans, right, used to be the DJ booth. You was able, at first it used to be like in a booth, like a glass booth. And this guy named Ian and another dude named Kenny Boo, he was actually in that mixer. Mm. And man, I used to just watch him, you know, moving the record back and forth. And I was like, damn, I can't do that at home. We got a rubber mat on ours, you know. Yeah. I wonder what the hell, how is this record able to slide like that? So I, it took me a minute, a lot of little trial and error, man. I, like you say, I broke a few needles at the crib, but I was able to go to this spot called ADL that was in West End, okay. like in this West End Plaza, man. Uh, the building is still there, but this dude used to sell all kind of needles and stuff. So I was able to replace the needles when I broke them, you know what I mean? So, yeah, man. So a lot of that, I always have just been into the I knew I had an interest in it, man, but I still didn't know if I was going to be a DJ or okay. a producer. I was just, Word. just my interest in music, reading the back of album covers mm-hmm. and falling asleep with needle all the way to the end of the record, going yeah. to Turtles records and tapes. Um, there was a spot called Peaches records and tapes. And man, sometimes on the weekend, me and my parents and my, uh, my sister, man, we'd be up like midnight buying records. We, we buying the 45 and they buying the albums mm-hmm. and we just play music all night, man, yeah. up to like three, four in the morning. What was that crate digging experience like, you know, back then? Because a lot of the records, like, didn't even have uh, text on it where you even knew what it was. So you looking through and just, like, picking, like, the flyers artwork. or just- Man, I was going by all that. Yeah, I was looking at the artwork, the clothes they had on. I used to be amazed by some of the shit that the Osley brothers were wearing. Huh. They was fly, the long chains oh, and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. But then little did I know is that a lot of those fly outfits, they was mimicking the pimps and the hustlers. Right. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so that's been around for the longest right. as far as like the street guys being the influence on the cats in the entertainment yeah. business sure. as well as athletes. Yeah. 
you know, the whole that, make it a, rain. That's a Ill contrast you just did. Stand on that. the couch. Yeah. All that yeah. was the influence of the street guys. Because even when you period. think about like back in the day in New York culture with like Dapper Dan, cats like that, like he was dressing all the street cats in yes, like the high end stuff. So then and that's the what made Harry B. And, exactly. And LL and them start winning. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Mike Tyson start coming yeah, to Yeah, there you yeah. go. There you go. Because, yeah, nah, man, it was only a few cats who could really afford those suits. We're right. talking about, you know, $500 outfits, thousands, right. some of them. So yeah, the, the hustle, street guys always had an influence, man, yeah. on on the entertainment and the athletic side of no, it. No, for sure. You know, we seeing the good and the bad side of it. You got cats want to wave pistols on cameras and shit now, oh, man. That's, so yeah, it's getting that, a little out of hand. That's crazy, you know. No, so you know, speak, speaking of John Morant, you know, yeah, like, oh Morant, <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, you see how now they're trying to um, put the focus on hip hop as being the no. blame for like why he's waving his gun and all that. I don't like that. I don't like it either, but um, I'm 50-50 with it, though, to be honest, you know, and I'm a hip-hop advocate, you know, to the fullest, like, this is my shit. I live and die by it, you know? Um, but I've been complaining about this shit before it got to this point for a long time, man. Yeah. I'm talking about, like, going on maybe eight years ago. I was sitting on panels, and I was straight up. I'm like, yo, man, you know, they were like, yo, man, how you feel about Atlanta, you know, just... The South just running the whole rap, you know, the hip hop game for the past years and it's just having a, a grasp on it. I'm like, yeah, it's cool, but now we letting the outside gang cultures take over the South, man. We ain't never claimed no Crips and Bloods right, down here, right. ever. Everybody had their little neighborhood cliques, you know right. what I mean? Down by laws, straight cats, and long list of other little people, man, you know. Um, yeah, from Georgia to Florida to Alabama, all these places, you know, they wasn't really claiming that too tough. But, um, and I said it was before, man, so, but since those five movie, movies came out of the West Coast, Colors, American Me, Boys in the Hood, um, Menace to Society, Menace to Society and um, what was the other one? We do um, nah, it was like, uh, what was it called? It was like it was a dude claiming deuce, and he had to get his son I don't know what you're the talking people about. took he his had, he took his braids. son. He yeah, oh, the dark skin dude. Yeah, yeah, the actor. I ain't seen him in nothing lately either. I, yeah, I know. He was a great actor. Man, I can't think I know his what name. You're talking about. Um, yeah. yeah, but that yeah. that particular those five movies back to back, mm-hmm. bro. It's like that's when everybody started feeling like, oh shit, man, we we want to live that. We want to start mm-hmm. wearing khakis now. Mm-hmm. So that that's what really kind of turned hip hop out a little bit, man. Yeah. You know what I mean? People start seeing it. Like right, right now, it irks me when I see rappers with guns in their videos or whatnot, mm-hmm. right? There's a rapper right now that I'm interested in that my manager just called me about. Uh-huh. And, um, and he's like, yo, put him up on YouTube and like three, four videos in a row. He's talking about rap his ass off too. Mm-hmm. And got a nice voice and everything, but every song is about spinning the block. Guns all in the video, you know what I mean? Rest in peace to trouble. I mean, the first time I saw his video with all them guns, I was yeah. like, hey, bro. Bust him. Stop it, man. Please, man. Cut that shit out. Because it was killing me, man. And yeah. I mean, I, I got a little street in me. I done played around out here. Thankful I ain't never just been on the deadly side. I was on the getting money side, yeah. you know what I mean? But, um, and just to see, like, I can truly say I'm 50-50 on it, man. It, it, does, it, is, it does have an influence on, and you got to think, he's a kid. Yeah. You know, you think just because he's playing, you know, basketball that he's, yeah, he's a grown man. We're grown, but he's watching cats his age and cats older than him right. waving guns and doing that shit. So, hey, yeah, it has an influence, bro. Yeah, yeah. yeah it does. I'm not going to run from that. And, yeah, yeah. as much as I love hip hop, that's, we, it's, it's a lightweight attack on us, but, uh, we, we, we do have to take some type of blame for that, bro, to be honest. Yeah, it's crazy, man. I mean, like, even you see, like, people comparing him to, you know, players like Chris Kamen and other like white players who might have posted pictures of them like with guns and at the gun range. But I don't know. I, I just I just feel like, you know, like I don't feel like it's the first time he had a pistol in a club or something. right? Yeah. First time I was in a club. See, all that, man. Yeah. All that shit. It's like, bro, just the fact that you waving a pistol in public, you know what I mean, two, in two different scenarios, like that, that's the issue. And my whole thing, I was just asking one of my youngest, man, I'm like, so what is that proving? Is that supposed to signify that he's hard, that he's street, don't nobody touch me, 
Boy, I, I think to like, I, come on, man. I think to a cat from the suburbs, that's supposed. They think that that is what's supposed to make them. I'm supposed to go, yeah. Yeah, you know what I mean. Man, I swear, bro. If the NBA, the NFL, anybody, man, could give me about a good 500k a year, <laughs> just to sit with certain athletes who yeah. they may have problems with, yeah. man, I, I can get them guys straight, bro. Yeah. Cause you gotta really get in their mind and really just let them know, play, almost hold a mirror up, be like, hey man, you know you look stupid as hell. You look lame as fuck, bro. Yeah. Like, how you think Jordan got here? How you think Magic got here, man? Uh -huh. They kept a clean face. The boys knew how to dress. They pulled their pants up. Yeah. You know what I mean? You saw a few of them fight out there on the court. That's, right, that right. comes with the game. Right. But all that outside activity, yeah. nah, man, man. Seeing this make me uh, have so much more respect for LeBron for having on, man. such a clean slate, you That's, know, his they, whole career. They like immediately that. put good people around him. He got up on the Jay-Z wing and a few, you know, yeah. and, and, he, and he kept his solid crew around him yeah, too. You, yeah. they was, you could tell they were some gentlemen. Now, yeah, one absolutely. of them happened to be one of them ignorant motherfuckers. There ain't no telling where LeBron would have went. But right, That's right. Luckily, his circle, and it ain't no telling where he may have trailed off. They were like, hey, man, and yeah. snatched him and back into reality. Yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And um and to keep it a hundred, it also helps when you got a, a queen to balance your shit off too. Yeah, that's for real too. <laughs> I was just reading It's something. dangerous to being famous and, and and successful man single dog. It's a lot, you know, you're a target. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's real. Um I was reading a quote that said like that a man is only as successful as uh as the woman that he keeps you know meaning like if you have a woman that supports you being successful then you can be more successful yeah, if you got a man, woman that's, that's been not supporting that then that could be you can play so you know? many celebrity scenarios and say ah ah he was all right right here but oh he got here oh shit went yeah that's just how the universe works how god do it that's how yeah. the universe is gonna do that, cause if you don't have that balance, man, you, you're gonna you're gonna be out here in trouble, dog. Yeah, yeah. And oh boy, he's a perfect example of it, man. Yeah, no, nah, yeah. nah, that's real. So, man, so when did you uh, jump off the porch? When did I jump off the porch? Yeah. As if let's be super clear. Okay, cool. So, like, you know, jumping off the porch is basically like when you stepped outside of the parents' crib, stepped oh, outside. Okay, you, you know, know what? Like, that, 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 I'm tripping. Yeah. Um. I could say I jumped off the porch and had to come back upstairs on a few hey, <laughs> occasions. Come on, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, for sure. So, for sure. Um, the first time I would say I jumped off the porch, man, uh, is a little after I graduated high school. Okay. Um, during high school, I think when I had my little own little car and I'm uh, DJing parties, I'm making about five, maybe seven hundred a week off mixtapes, parties, mm -hmm. and cutting hair here and there. Excuse me, so I was doing some everything, man. My hands, that's what my gift is, my hands. Huh. I need to insure them, reinsure them joints. Um, <laughs> but even when I was in a like, senior in high school, like I say, I was around older cats, so I was like, man, you know, shit, man, why well, I gotta sneak, man? I, I, I can afford my own apartment. Huh. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm here, you know, like, shit, man, I can get an apartment around there. And the, matter of fact, too, not too far from here, uh, what was the street? Um, Exit past Six Flags. Not Thornton. Not, not, not. Before you get to Thornton. But it was all kind of little apartments up yeah. and down there. What really one of the first QTs on this side. Yeah, Riverside? Riverside. Yeah. Yeah, it used to be all kind of little apartments over there. One of my homeboys had a spot. And I was like, man, I think I can go and get me one, you know. So I was trying to jump off the porch then. My parents were like, no, okay, yeah, 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 no, no, we ain't gonna let you do that. We know what you're trying to do. We yeah, know what I mean? We, we see how you sneak up out of here sometimes, you yeah. know? They lock the door when I come home too late or whatnot. Yeah, yeah. But um, when I truly, truly jumped off the porch, man, is when uh, MC Shadi had discovered me. Uh, and I was DJing at a step show at the Civic Center. Okay. And um, I was on turntables doing all kind of tricks. And people had told MC Shadi about me. You know, I know y'all know Shadi, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah legendary. Um, MC yes, sir. From and um, and he came to the step show because I had won a, um, me and my little crew, we had won a DJ battle at the Civic Center a little bit before that. And um, so I had been touring with Raheem the Dream. You know, the first mm -hmm. song I produced that was an '85 Raheem the Dream that we did, Eliminator. But we would do shows like in Alabama and drive back the same night, mm -hmm. Pelham, Georgia, and come back. You know, different little areas at the yeah. uh, National Guard. Armory and all them little type of venues or whatnot. Yeah. But we would come home that next night or the, either the next day or the, the same night. But when Shadi, um, like I said, a little bit, uh, it was right before I graduated though. Mm. 
And Shadi came to the crib, man, and he was like, yo, you want to talk to my parents about me going on tour with them? Mm. And that's something I've been looking forward to, man. Cause I used to see Bobcat and LL and them on stage, man. I was like, bro, I want to be on tour just like that, Word. you know? And, um, and Shadi came to my house with his schedule, man. It was about 10 dates, man, from Carolina all the way to um, California and Fresno and San Jose. I'm like, damn, bro, I've never even been out of Georgia huh. ever in my life. Yeah. Cause my family didn't really travel too tough, you know what I mean? And, uh, and my mom was like, boy, you ain't getting on no airplane? I'm like, yeah, I don't want to get on no airplane. Shadi like, man, you tripping, you know? Right, right. And my mom, you know, after a while, but we like, it, it was like, Two, three months before I graduated, it was okay. like, hey, you know, honestly, you ain't even out of school yet. So, but bro, I, after I graduated, I would say, cause they, they ended up um, starting that tour. And boy, I was in school. So you, so you didn't go on that tour? I didn't tour? go. Okay. okay. I'm back in, I'm at Thero, right? Yeah. In class, telling folks like, nigga, boy, as soon as we march, <laughs> boy, I'm going to Miami, bro. I'm about to get with Luke, too. Uh-huh. Like, cool, shoddy, man, I'm finna be on tour. Yeah. Yeah, you lying, you lying? I'm like, bro, I'm telling you. Man, things finna change. Y'all might not see me. Y'all, some yeah. of y'all going to the military, some going to college. Man, I'm finna jump in this music business, man. Huh. I'm finna go on the road, I'm finna tour. And um, yeah, bro. And once I a little bit like a month or two after I graduated, man, they came back with the tour bus, snatched me up. And man, I was out on the road, bro. And that was my first time really, I could say truly jumping off the porch. From the porch into the music game. Oh man, come on. You know? And I mean, that had to be a crazy experience, like hitting the road at that point. Yeah, man. I mean, the youngest you... dude on the tour bus. Like I say, he learned a lot fast. Yeah. You remember <laughs> some of like the first couple cities that y'all was hitting in? Mm-hmm. And like, like Carol like Sir Paul of Carolina, um Virginia. We hit a lot of Florida. And um, then we took the plane, and that's when we went to um, California. We were doing yeah. like car shows, man. That's my first time really seeing, cause I used to buy the magazines, but man, I'm seeing all these six fours and live, right? All these custom trucks and shit. Yeah. Mexicans and just all these Spanish folks everywhere, man. That's when I start understanding the whole gang culture. Yeah. You know, and um, cause my man Bobcat, who's DJ for LL, he was mm-hmm. he was the first one telling me about the whole Crip and Blood thing. And I was just like, oh, okay. I, that's when I was like, oh, that's some Cali shit. Yeah. You know, it's a West Coast or the right. Bay, you know, like, you know, just that, that West Coast type shit. Yeah. But yeah, mm-hmm. man, but um, I, I, like I said, it, <clears throat> it was a life changing experience, man. You know, yeah. that's why I, I get shot E props to this day, man. But like, being the first guy to really take me and get me out of the, out of my regular environment, bro. Yeah, man, because you gained so, you had to have gained so much um, perspective from that, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? And then to be able to bring that back home to right. your partners that's, you know, at one, that's similar to how you were at one point where they haven't traveled either. Bruh, so they you know, I couldn't to, wait to come home and tell them stories, <laughs> bro. They were like, man, for real? I'm like, yeah, dude. Not to mention the groupie stories. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yo, so it's funny <laughs> because I'm thinking about it too. Like, you know, being on the road back then, like no internet, no social media. You know what I'm saying? So No you, camera, no nothing. Right, right. Just right. my word. You yeah. Know? And some people, you know, you had big, the, think about how big cameras were back right, then, right. man. Nobody wasn't lugging no cameras around. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Nah, that's ill, man. Yo, how'd you get the name Toomp? Toomp. <laughs> well, man, I'm born in 1969. My sister, five years older than me. And uh, she's looking at my baby crib and just be like, he's my Toomp Poom, my Toompy Toompy. Huh. I don't know where she got that name from. It's yeah. just a nickname, bro. And uh, it was Toompy at first, but as I got older, around like 14, I, I cut the Y off. I was like, all right, I'm just going to keep Toomp. Yeah. And next thing you know, man, teachers start calling me to everybody. Like, uh, you know, Aldrin Davis is my government name, right. you know, named after the astronaut Buzz Aldrin. Huh. Um, happened to be into astrology too, yeah. you know, I'm one of them UFO gods type dudes, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, man, my sister gave me that name. Word, okay. That's yeah. kind of. That, that's, that's, Davis, yeah, she gave me that name. Okay, it's kind of similar to Snoop. What I think Snoop's nickname was Snoopy, you yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. And he took the Y off. Yeah, I, yeah, I got the Thero. One, it was like, um, he's like, man, you know, there's another dude that that Thero with a name like yours. Oom. Uh-huh. I'm like, oom, for real? I'm like, toomp, like oom, like toomp with no T. Huh. He was like, oom, and then you know, me and Corey Robinson, big oom. Right. You know what I mean? Yes, sir. Who happened to be in the music business too? Right, right. Later on, so all that shit is crazy. Bro. Yeah, and so and and that's why I was asking too because I was mm-hmm. wondering if like it was some kind of 
you know, I'm not from Atlanta, so mm-hmm. I'm wondering, like, man, is, is Toomp and then is Oomp, is that connecting? Is that connected Honestly, to some kind of Atlanta slang? On some, on some like underworld so. shit, it's kind of, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's crazy because we, we slightly parallel, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, Oomp had a straight street side to him, me too. And we happened to be in the music business. His old man was out there in the street super yeah. strong. My old man was too. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like the same thing, like the yeah. Oomp and Toomp story. Word. Them shit's kind of run neck and neck. I just happen to be a producer. Word, word. Him and the CEO, yeah. And, and speaking of your and pops. we both went to Thero High. And speaking of your pops, he had done some time uh, yeah. when you was younger too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you uh, talk about like how that affected you coming up? Uh, well, um, definitely, man, because I'm going to tell you, it's really like, yeah, yeah that's, that's something that you know that part. Because um, I said I was going to put it in a book. Cause it's, it's, it's it kind of remind you of uh, what movie that I be watching? It would remind me of that. You remember the movie uh, Blow? Oh yeah. And you remember um, when old boy had to when he was talking to his girlfriend? He said, "Yeah, you know, I'd be out in five years," and she's like, "Hey, I don't have five years." Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Same thing. My mom was getting said had got colon cancer, and my pop he messed around and got caught up you know what i mean it, it was crazy because it was meant for him to to go sit down for that because if he wouldn't have went and sat down for them five years he would have got caught up in this federal case that was boiling too mm-hmm. so he basically got snatched out of that equation because wow. that five could have been 10 or 15 or 20. okay but um and it was something man um to where because they didn't reveal to me and my sister and them that my mom was really dealing with it we knew something was wrong but we didn't know what mm-hmm. and then later on uh, after pop got caught up and uh, I was going back and forth to Cobb County, you know, we'd go to court or whatnot. And, um, and finally he was like, hey man, on one of them trips back home from court, he was like, yo man, uh, I'm gonna have to sit down for a while, bro. And you're gonna have to take care of your mom. I'm like, take care of her? What you mean by that? Hmm. He said, man, you know, she dealing with cancer or whatnot. I'm like, I was like, so I said, man, they can't keep you before, you know, and just let you deal with her? Wow. He's like, no, nah, I gotta, they got to send me off. So them five years, bro, mm-hmm. it, you know how usually, and you know, the, the perfect story is, oh, that dad being there with his wife or the wife being there with her husband, yeah. and, you know, vice versa. Mm-hmm. Now it was left up to the kids to take care of mom. So that was my first true, true experience of responsibility. Bro, that was, was when you jumped care. off the porch. That's when I, that, you know what? That's the real jump off the porch. Bro, Keeping that was it when you jumped off the porch. It's taking care of mom. Come on now. Yeah. You know, it's crazy how, you know, you know, people say life keep life in, you know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? Yeah. Like it just keep throwing stuff at you. And we never know when, man, like we're, we're thrown in these situations Boy, where we're forced. You can't gauge to, that. Yeah. Yeah. You don't know. It could be in the middle of no, it come out of nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. Man. Yes, sir. Nah, man. It, 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 it makes us, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, cause you can either, you can either come out of that or you can fold. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And during that time, um, you know, <laughs> just like a nigga would do. There's a few uh, lines that I kept open. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And uh, but at the same time, I was like, I had a chance to really see the responsibility that my dad and his brothers had. Cause see, my dad, the oldest out of four brothers, mm. but he, you know, he he outlived. You know, he lived longer than them. Mm. So, and like a lot of them, all of them were hustling together in Summerhill. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So all that Reed Street, Terry Street, that whole Georgia Avenue by Cheney Stadium, that whole area. So, yeah, man, me and my sister taking care of her, and then having to make sure Pop had st- stuff straight. Then his mom, my grandma, was still living, so yeah. I had to fill in them gaps for that. So man, like I say, with my uh, little royalty checks that I started getting come in from Dr. Doolittle, and um. And just in hustling, you yeah. know what I mean? I was able to really keep, you know, taxes paid or whatever and take care of mom until she was out, you know? And then, but the good thing about it, they let the old man come home for the funeral. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? So yeah. I went to Burlington, bought him a suit right quick or right. whatnot. And the uh, state patrol, man, he wasn't really just up on him. He just let him, you know, let pop kick it, you know yeah. what I mean? To yeah. where it wasn't just so obvious. Yeah. Yeah, man. So yeah, that was, that was, uh, that shit turned me yeah. into a man fast. Yeah, nah, for real. I mean, I was already felt like I was on some grown man shit, uh-huh. but that turned it up, man. I feel yeah. you. That, that was, uh, that was another version that was, of jumping off that porch. Absolutely. Bro, absolutely. 
Can you talk about the emotion of your pops being out of jail, but still is a prisoner, mm -hmm. but then you're able to be next to him and, and, and all of that, but then knowing that he's got to go back in, like, what's that feeling like? Man, it was, it was, it, it cause he didn't have all, uh, he only had what? Two more years. Okay. So it was kind of cool. Okay, word. Yeah, it yeah. was like, yeah, nigga, you'll be old soon. Right, you right, know right. what I mean? Yeah. So, um, but yeah, but seeing them real quick, you know, because me, I was visiting them any, you know, I was going, you know, visiting them anyway. But uh, the relatives was like, oh, then when they watched them grow up, they were like, no. Yeah. You know what I mean? His yeah. mom, you know what I mean? So, and his sisters, you know, which is my aunties and them, they was just like, oh, they taking him away. I'm like, yeah, he got to go back, y'all. Yeah. You know, he home, home. <laughs> it's just for the funeral. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, yeah, it was, it was something, man. It's an experience, dog. Word, word. Mm -hmm. no, I can dig it, man. So, man, jumping back into music, um, so after you, went on the road with uh, MC Shy D. Now, at what point did you uh, meet Uncle Luke and then go hmm. to Florida? Well, because you, because you cause, cause, yeah, for, cause what you happened. for Two Live Crew, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because at first, I just working with Shy D, but then um, it was time, because, you know, first Shy D did an album in 86 called Gotta Be Tough. Okay. Um, and that was him and DJ Man. So by the time uh, I think him and DJ Man they went they separate ways and that's when he wanted uh, he got me and this other guy named Mike Fresh mm -hmm. and Mike Fresh we grew up in the same neighborhood together he's like five years older than me mm -hmm. so we all collect, uh, produced together on that first on that second album which is coming correct in '88. Okay. And you got all three of us on the album cover with our little Georgia Bulldogs gear and shit you know the red and black representing the South you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, and, and that was the back time, in the too. I don't mean to cut mm -hmm. you oh, it's off, good, but, it's good. But, but at the time, the music that's coming out of Atlanta is like is like that is like the bass heavy music, right? It's kinda. Okay. It was still bass. It was a little bass. Um, the bass was really just starting with that. Cause honestly, you know that it, that came from Miami, man. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of. It was, I don't know a lot if you really know, but in Florida, that was really the home of a lot of um, independent labels. Mm -hmm. You had Luke. Yeah, a, uh, ADE's label, what that, uh, Foresight Records, they were out of Fort Lauderdale. Mm -hmm. You had Suntown Records, and you had um, Base Station, which was this guy named uh, Roberto Morales. Mm -hmm. um, he used to be competing with Luke. Luke used to have a pack jam, and uh, Roberto, N N N N N Norberto used to have the uh, Base Station, which was a club. And, and the way DJs would battle in Miami, they'd have like a big wall of speakers. And whoever shit just hit the hardest. Yeah, I don't know if you've uh, ever seen that whole uh, Miami lifestyle, man. It might be stacked up about 50 speakers, a big tower, whoever uh, tower. And, and bro, and it's a, and the, and the sound incredible because they were stacked with all these crown amps and whatnot. So, but anyway, yeah. So when we were on the road, I say after doing a few little joints back and forth, man, we were touring with some of everybody, man. Airbnb and Rakim. Uh, Shit, Jazzy Jeff and Fresh Prince. Anybody who you know was kicking b between, was popular in 87, 88, we done shows with them. Salt and Pepper, everybody. And so Shadi was like, hey man, um, cause we done shows in Miami, I mean in Florida, but we haven't been to Miami yet. So that was my whole thing. It was like, boy, I can't wait to see Miami. Yeah. You know, I went to Orlando and other little parts of Florida, Jacksonville, but I was still like, man, I still ain't seen Miami yet. Yeah. And Shadi was like, hey man, it's time to work on this second album. So, you know, let's start getting stuff together. And we went and bought SP 1200s and just got all our shit together and, and went back to Miami, man, and, and uh, had us in a hotel or whatnot. And we was just working on the album. And uh, just that whole Miami lifestyle, man, I, I just, I get it. Yeah. I understood it. The gold teeth, top and bottom, you yeah. know. But up here we had just the tops, you know, mm -hmm. down there you see more bottom teeth. Mm -hmm. I was down there, something about Florida, they dentists used to just do bottom goals huh. a lot better than anybody else anywhere else. And um, the uh, bowling ball paint jobs, which a lot of body guys can't do that to this day. It's yeah. an art to that shit. I'm talking about fading, man. This guy Convertible Burt, you got Murph, you got Big Nate. Man, all kind of folks, man, just pulling up in these Mercedes with curtains in them. Uh, might be a light burgundy and it fade into a dark burgundy with uh, alligator uh, bowling ball effects on it. Like I've never seen those shit like that. So, yeah. but it's gangster though because I was able to really compare these different lifestyles. Like I, I had to, I had a chance to see the West Coast and mm -hmm. how they rock their vehicles. But mm -hmm. man, when I saw how they were doing their vehicles in Florida, like yeah. the Miami, them Florida boys, yeah, I was like, okay, this uh, is more like it. This, yeah. this is more like my my shit. You know, I respect the low riders and. 
all that, you know, that was cool. But that the way they were fixing them cars up in Miami was, that was my shit. Yeah, you know I what I mean? Like, and I just happened to still be into cars this day. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Word, word. And, um, and you had Clay D, um, Magic Mike, everybody was down there around that time, mm-hmm. bruh. And everybody had their drum machines and that whole bass movement. So we brought some Atlanta, even when I was with Raheem, I shit was kind of, it wasn't bass shit, it was kind of like still hip hop. Because okay. I was like, if you think about the first Raheem record and uh, the other song, Eliminator, we was on that kind of LL cut creator type yeah, shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? But then, so when me and Mike Fresh went to Miami with Shy D, we had a chance to absorb that vibe of the whole bass movement. Okay. Turning the BPM up faster than like 128. They started going to like 140, super fast. You know, they love, they love jit dance. They be yeah, yeah. running around the club, just, <laughs> just ticking and doing all their little club, uh, dances and whatnot. So yeah. like I say, it was a whole nother world down there, bro. The, the lifestyle, the tempo, man, the girls down there was naturally fat asses. like. Yeah. No surgeries, no nothing. We was just like, man, what the hell is in the water down here? This shit is crazy. Yeah. So it was a hell of an experience to me, bro. Um, but we happened to, me and my fresh, we ended up learning that whole lifestyle as far as, you know, how to adjust our 808s, mm-hmm. how to stretch them out. Of course, my man, Mr. Mix, David Hobbs, which is Two Live Crews producer, mm-hmm. he showed me a few tricks on the SB1200 mm-hmm. that like, really played a part in my career for yeah. sure. You know what I mean? Right. And uh, we brought that back up here. Mm-hmm. And that's when Atlanta started catching on to our booty shake bass music. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we brought that back up here. Word. Okay. Yeah. okay. Me, Mike Fresh, and the other guy named Cooley C, who produced for the Hard Boys. Okay. Yeah. Word, word. Okay. And I mean, bass was so big, you know, here. I mean, I, I mean that whole mm-hmm. movement, all that. Mm-hmm. Shorty swing my way, like all that. Thing. Yeah, yeah. But that definitely, that, 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 that came from us bringing that Miami bass up here. Word. Yeah. Okay. That played and a major then, part. And so I know I was asking you like uh, how you linked with uh, with Uncle Luke and mm. everything. There you go. So it's funny because I, I was sitting going in a circle. The first DJ, the DJ battle that I, I was in at the Civic Center, after the DJ battle, the special guest was the two live crew. That's when okay. they had Throw That D. Mm-hmm. So they was watching this whole, so they came to, to the city like, um, like two days before the event. So... On pub on like on that little public access TV, they would run commercials on this DJ battle, mm-hmm. and it was us against uh, DJ New York and uh, whatever crew, mm-hmm. and we had a little commercial like we was called the ATL crew, oh. and I was like, yeah, at the Civic Center, buddy, at the Civic Center, it's gonna go down, you know what <laughs> I mean? The whole little thing like we were battling, had the police between us, yeah, and my man Fresh Kid Ice, may he rest in peace, the Chinaman, yeah, man, when he saw us at the Civic Center. He was like, yeah, the Civic Center, buddy. Cause he was, he was talking country as hell. I didn't realize how country we were. <laughs> and they was joining us back then. I'm talking about that dude didn't know us or nothing, but when he saw us, he was like, man, that's the dudes who was on TV we just saw. Yeah. So that's when I met Luke and all of them before even meeting Shadi. Right. And just, and later on, I hadn't seen them dudes since then until we had to come back to Miami. And that's when Kid Ice was like, man, I remember you. Huh. You were that dude that was on that damn, uh, you know what I mean? I'm like, damn, dog, that's crazy you remember that. I, yeah. So I met Luke and them then, but meeting them again, and it's just full circle, man. They already had that respect for me because they saw me on the turntables, but they didn't know that I produced. Oh, gotcha. And so when the production side came out, and that's when we started making all them records, you know, in Atlanta and, you know, scratching all them samples in and whatnot. Yeah. yeah that's when we brought a whole nother side because they was wondering what Shadi was going to come with on the second album. Mm-hmm. Cause him and Mr. Mix produced some of the first album, mm-hmm. but, but Shadi kept telling Luke, "Hey man, I'm bringing my dudes from Atlanta down here, mm-hmm. and my sound finna goddamn go up here." And that's yeah. when we, you know, and I came up with the song "Shake It," yeah, okay, which was the last song on the album. Right. Come on, shake, shake it, yeah, yeah, and they ended up being the biggest joint. Word, yeah. that's hard. That's hard. Mm-hmm. So were you were you around and, and and were you guys releasing music like during this whole like time of censorship with rap music and when Luke was, you know. Uh, you know, getting like the, the, the parental advisory sticker. Yeah, we was stuff. getting away with a lot before it got to that point. Mm-hmm. That was like uh, around 90, because I was on that band in the USA tour. Okay. With, uh, I was DJing for Poison Clan around that time. Okay, word, well, yeah. And, um, but yeah, before that, man, um, throw that dick, throw that dick. And all them, you know, we was scratching all them Rudy Ray Moore records in with Mr. <laughs> Mix, with uh, Mons Mabley and all them old comedy records. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of that X-rated stuff, it wasn't no problem until it started hitting the white community. That's yeah. when they started trying to, you know, censor it. But, you know, and they... 
Because Two Live Crew, like I say, was some hood, Liberty City shit at first, but then that shit started spreading, you know, around. And, and, and two of the guys from Cali anyway, so it started picking up on the West Coast. And next thing you know, it went from being an all-black crowd to now you got these, you're doing these beach parties and there's white folks out here repeating, hey, we want some pussy, all yeah. these songs. So when it started hitting they, uh, their community, that's when it started becoming a problem. But long as it was just black folks doing that shit, it was nothing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. And um, and that was a hell of a time they went through too, man. And that's why you got to give uh, Luke his props on that. Because mm -hmm. he definitely took a stand, man, and really, you know, he laid it down. They paved the way for a lot of people who continue to use explicit lyrics to this yeah. day. Nah, for you sure. You know what I mean? For so, sure. I yeah. Mean, that was huge. Yeah, right. he can go down history for that, for sure. Yeah. <clears throat> and being one of the most successful um, independent record labels too. Yeah, nah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Man, so when did you meet T.I.? Huh, Clifford Harris. I met Tip um, after playing around in Miami for a while, man, and I uh, decided to come back to Atlanta around like 92, 93. And uh, by that time, LaFace was here. Okay. And I kept hearing, when I was in Florida, they kept saying, hey man, LA and Babyface, and then started labeling in Atlanta called LaFace. And I'm like, damn. Who's doing the production? And when they told me, I was like, organized noise. And I still didn't know who that was. I was like, Rico. I said, man, I used to do they dance tapes. You know what I mean? I used to do they, uh, like for the talent shows, yeah. I used to make him Sleepy Brown and them. I used to make the uh, talent show tapes. Wow. I didn't know they were producing. And I was like, man, let me get my ass to Atlanta, bro. I'm missing out. Yeah. You know, and this bass shit, you know, and, and I'm learning the industry too, realizing like, damn, I produced this New Jack City soundtrack. This shit done sold four million and all I got was $1,500. Right, right. So, Cause you, cause you produce Dick in the Dirt. One of the, one of the uh, yeah. two live crew songs. On that, yeah, Dick yeah. in the Dirt. Yep. Yeah. That's the part when uh, G Money is riding in the Jeep saying, yo, this is that crack shit. Yeah. He was showing the little bottle. But, um, and that's when I decided to come back to Atlanta. Um, but my goal was to come back and get, and to get hooked up with LaFace. Okay. But I didn't know how I was going to do it. You know what I mean? I ended up running into Rico and them, but that still wasn't the, my way to them. And at the same time, I knew I needed an artist too. Mm -hmm. So on my, throughout my journey, you know, uh, looking for an artist, I just end up, you know, still working on some more beats. And that's when I end up doing Shawty Freak a little something for uh, Lil John. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, he was like, I would say, yeah, he the first one who I really produced when I came back from Florida, when I decided to really, truly leave Florida. Okay. And uh, a little bit after that, man, uh, one of my partners who I used to get down with, my boy Tremel Morgan, AKA Two, but he rest in peace. Been knowing him since like fifth, fourth grade, in elementary school and mm -hmm. um, man on the low, man, we was just shit, doing grown man shit, hustling in the neighborhood. Nobody yeah. knew what we was up to. We pulling up in six series, beamers and everything. Huh. You know, jury game, you know, kind of fly. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. People still didn't know what the hell we was up to though. Cause you fresh off the road, been moving around, you got motion, all yeah, that. So, so you come back to the city. Yeah. Huh, looking yeah, like something. Yeah, yeah. fly, yeah, <laughs> yeah, real fly. Yeah. Um, Folk were trying to figure it out, man. I was just, I used to stay under the radar. But he used to always tell me about his, his little cousin that rap. Mm. And uh, finally, I was like, man, bring that nigga through. Let me see what you're talking about. Word. And bro, that boy Tip came, th came up in the driveway. I had my little 300 ZX. Had a cassette. Yes, a cassette. <laughs> um, he played about five records to me, man. And um, it was him and the PSC. Mm. And it's funny, uh, every verse, Every time he got to a verse where well, I'd be like, oh my God, who is that? That nigga said some shit. He'd be like, yeah, that's me. So after he said that on four different occasions, I was yeah. like, yo, bro, we need to get you. We'll come back to the PSC, but right yeah. now we're focusing on you. And um, yeah, man, his cousin Toot made that happen. Word. Yeah. When you first met Tip, was he as cocky as? Yes, he was. That's why I'm on trip, man. You know how some people, oh man, that boy, that button got money and woo woo woo. Yeah. Nah, he was that little hard headed motherfucker back there too. Yeah. He yeah. loved every minute of him. You know what I mean? Um, that's just a part of his 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 makeup, you know. And 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 he know how to use it now that he's you know more mature. Right, right. He 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 know how to use it in the right way and at the right time. That's mm -hmm. why I kind of like he because he's a lightweight comedian too. You yeah. know what I mean? So yeah. he'd be joning. That's how we used to do it, just joning in the studio yeah. all the time anyway. And um. But yeah, that's just, it, 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 it used to be a little hard-headed. We had to get him out of jail a few times, huh. you know what I mean? But uh, she, he was a jack of all type of trades too, cause he was cutting fades also. Right. Yeah, so he used to be cutting in Toots. Uh, cause Toots had a barbershop right over there by Greenbrier. Uh -huh. And so uh, yeah, and every, you know, non-licensed barbers, me, 
Tip and, you know, well, Toot had license, but me and Tip yeah. didn't have no license. You know, it's crazy, man. Like, uh, so many so many rappers, producers, or just creatives, period, like, have been barbers. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's interesting. I mean, like... We either know how to draw and paint. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. do all that shit. Yeah, yeah. Graffiti. I've, yeah. I've heard, like, Kanye can cut. I remember, like, the artist V.I.C. He mm-hmm. was a barber. Yeah. Uh, you know, just, it's, just, it's just crazy. Just so many different rappers I've mm-hmm. heard, like, say that they cut as well. Or, or, and like all I that said, shit is art. People. You know? Yeah. It's all under the uh, umbrella of art, you know? But yeah, man, uh, yeah, that was the introduction of me and Clifford Harris. Right. Nineteen ninety seven to be exact. Word. Okay. And what was it like working in the studio during those times? Like what were those sessions like? Hmm. The first session, um, we did like five songs. That's what really got everybody's attention because mm-hmm. the stuff that he had, matter of fact, Tip did some of the beats on the cassette that he played for me. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Tip, fuck around when he want to. Huh. Yeah, you give yeah. him a phantom of a uh, trident or whatnot. Yeah, he get on. Yeah, he, he, may, he can actually sit right here and make a track. Easy, no wow. problem. Wow. Yeah, it was some decent shit. As a matter of fact, he produced a few on the first album. Um, T.I. versus T.I.P. Not mm-hmm. the album, but it was a song called T.I. versus T.I.P. Mm-hmm. on the first album. He produced that one. He actually did that whole track by himself. Wow. Um, but it was, um, I was blown away the first time we got in there because um, he, wouldn't, he didn't write. Mm-hmm. The man just went in there, he would pace around the room, looking at everybody, mm-hmm. and just go hit the booth, man, and, and lay that shit down. And yeah. That's the way he rocked to this day, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? Um, we still didn't know exactly where we was going, but we knew we had something. Mm-hmm. And I knew I had this sound, because it was some, I just started experimenting with different sounds, because you know, Coming from the Miami Booty Shake era, I was like, ah, right, it's time to slow this shit down, but mm-hmm. I still want to keep the 808 in it. And I want to get more musical, so I started getting better with my playing. I mean, I'm not classically trained, but yeah. I play by ear, you know. Mm-hmm. Thank God for sequencers. Hey. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah. I, could, I, could, I could still put you know, some shit together, make yeah. a masterpiece, actually. And, um, and once I figured out we had that chemistry, man, we started, we put like a five song demo together, and. Man, I started playing it for all my homeboys, and they was just like, dude, man, you got yourself something. I'm yeah. talking about some cats who some critical people who I was playing this music for. Yeah. I was kind of hesitant about playing that shit at first. Yeah. And I was like, man, yeah, tell me what y'all think about this. You hear folks that gather around, and each line he say, they be like, damn, how old is he? I'm like, man, nigga ain't but 19. Yeah. Man, that man rapping some grown man shit. Huh. And they was tripping off his patterns, his flow, mm-hmm. just the way it wasn't the, he wasn't the basic bouncing ball rapper. He was like in, really in between, like yeah. really flowing. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So that's what made me really just put a lot of my time and energy into him because I knew I had something. Right, I knew right. that shit right off the bat. And so were you, were you working with him before the, uh, be, before the LaFay situation? Yes, sir. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like, he, when I was working with him, it was just me, him, Toot, and the PSC. He ah, hadn't, Jason you. G, that wasn't even in the picture yet. Okay. So we had this demo. And um, then later on, I, I meet Jason. I was working on um, uh, Jim Crow's album. Okay. Yeah. At Patchwork, and Jason was an intern at Patchwork. Okay. You know, he was just well, just well, he was just work at the front desk. I don't know if he's intern or whatnot, but I used to just converse with Jason. Mm-hmm. And come to find out, he stayed in Ben Hill. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, damn, all right, you from Ben Hill? You know, coming to Row? All right, just holler at me, you know? Yeah. Cause he was fresh out of New Jersey. Mm-hmm. And so one day I just asked him like, man, what are you? You know, what's what's your what's your What's your, what's your angle? He's like, man, I want to get into management. Hmm. So I was like, shit, bro, I got an artist I've been working with, man. I'm not built for management, but hmm. you, see, I might have your first client here, dude. Word, word. So you I introduced them, and then we start hanging out, mm-hmm. just being Buckhead almost every night of the week. You don't know if you remember if you've been here that long, but mm-hmm. Buckhead, the whole village, man, it was like 10 different clubs to go to in Buckhead, mm-hmm. like in this whole little area. Okay. So it was just a mixture of black and white people. And then, of course, the niggas took over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, now they say Buckhead, the most dangerous neighborhood in the, in yeah, the U.S. Yeah, where all them shops at. The same place where Meech and them had that shootout at. Yeah. That's where all the clubs used to be in that whole little area. So we just, um, I, I introduced Tip to that, that night, to that oh, lifestyle because wow. he, you know, he was partying on this side, 559 five, and mm-hmm. stuff. So I was like, hey, man, let's go here. I'm going to show you a whole nother side. Mm-hmm. And, man, that young and man, you know, of course, he was too young to get in the clubs. But, bro, yeah. he, he held his own in there, like, coming across some badass women and whatnot. You know, so I was like, okay, yeah. this little dude here, he's seasoned, man. To be 19, 20 years old, he's pretty damn seasoned. So, yeah. 
And we just continued to go on, and Jason just happened to let KP hear that demo. And KP was, Kawan Prather, mm -hmm. was the A&R at LaFace at that time. So, so mission was accomplished. I ended up dealing with LaFace anyway. Right, but I right, thought right. I was going to do it through Outkast or Goody Bob, right, but it right. ended up being through my artist. Right. So when they called KP me attention. was a part of PA. PA, well. yeah. So, yep. yeah. So and PA, all yeah, all that was together. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. And okay. so, uh, matter of fact, and that's when, when KP heard him, he put Tip on PA's album. Okay. And that's when everybody was like, oh my God, who is that? Yeah. And that's when, boom, next thing you know, we got a deal at LaFace. It's funny, I remember I was working at Def Jam some years back, and uh, this is back when me and KP at first uh, met each other, mm -hmm. and, he came, and he came by my office one day, and I was bumping some PA, and he like walked past it, and he like, poked his head back and he was like, what you know about that? <laughs> I looked at him, I said, what you know about that? And he was like, okay. Yeah, like, man. Okay, nah, they blow you away. Stuff. Especially when you hear, I'm talking about, yeah. And that's how I feel too when I hear somebody playing something that's way, you know, of course, you know, when it's something that wasn't a big single or whatever, yeah. but that, that underground shit, you'd be like, yeah. oh, okay, dude, on this shit. Yeah, yeah I can see him doing sure. that. So when y'all was uh, recording the I'm Serious album, I mean, like, did y'all just know that, that y'all had something groundbreaking, you know, there when y'all was going to present it to L.A. and them? Man, yes. <laughs> I'm talking about even be like before even we had a deal. Like, I, I swear, man, with that cassette, that, that demo that we had, man, I was right. You know, cats be having the best dope and be thumping that sack. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I felt about that cassette, bro. Yeah. Everywhere I went when I played it, it was just like green lights for everybody, yeah. from strangers to where I knew I had something. That's why I was like, man, once we get a budget and a label behind us, man, this shit is out of here. This yeah. guy's out of here. But um, that first album, yeah, man, yeah. Right. And if you, mm -hmm. How much of the demo actually made it to be the first album? None of the songs. We tried. Huh. We, 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 that's, that's a great question. We re-recorded at least three songs off that demo that's still on the two-inch reel to this day. Um, but uh, they end up not making the album. Okay. So, so the demo definitely got the attention, uh, but they did. It didn't. The songs didn't make it though. Hmm. It was good. Good records too. Some cool Word. street nah, records. For yeah. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Uh, one of my favorite songs you produced on there was "Be Easy." Be uh, Easy. Okay. Yeah. That was trap music. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Nice. That's my dad's favorite song too. That yeah. was his favorite yeah, song. One of man. one of my favorite like tip songs that you didn't record. Wow. Whatever, so. Yeah. My dad used to always say that man. Be Easy, man. That be easy. It's just something about that. Yeah. Nah, yeah. Absolutely. Hell yeah. Um, can you talk about um, can you, can you talk about when you were uh, working with Lil John and like um, I know like you did like the Get Crunk song yeah yeah, yeah. um yep i had that did the get crunk and i did shawty freak a little something and another one called cut up that's why i kind of i played this too uh looking for some cut up <laughs> yeah um, um i, I kind of played this too short bass line in it mm. it was funny because um with uh Lil john they didn't really have a budget mm -hmm. so i was like man you know what man i'm just trying to get my feet wet and i always tell producers this a lot of times like man don't just get caught up to your producers fee because that back end can can help a whole lot more than you just fighting for this front end on mm -hmm. some occasions especially mm -hmm. if there's no money there mm -hmm. just go on and work it out you know and just know the back end to take care of you so with little john yeah i really didn't hit him for nothing up front i was just like we just worked out the publishing and the point spread or whatnot man it was cool man it's a nice little and to be a part of because uh i think that's when we had who you with mm -hmm. that caught on so and and it was funny, man, just to see a whole nother, we actually watch a whole nother era of, of genre of music start, which right. was crunk. Right. Because, you know, we, we thought, you know, you had to have a hook or you had to have verses. Like, right. whoa, this whole song, this man just chanting. Just chanting, yeah, yeah. This shit yeah. works. Yeah. And it, it, it worked. It, 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 it reminded me of, you know, Three Six Mafia's songs, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, back yeah, yeah. Then. And I, it's an influence. It's definitely, uh, uh, now, we definitely must say that the crunk is is an influence of that Memphis, Tennessee movement for sure. Yeah, I would definitely wouldn't try to say that we just made that up. Yeah, right. no, yeah, I'll sure. definitely give it to Memphis, Tennessee. Absolutely. But yeah, but you know, of course, we put our little twist to it, though. You yeah, know what for I mean? Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nah, I mean that's the beautiful. Shout thing. out to Memphis, man. Yeah, yeah. no, nah, for sure, man. Like that, that's the beautiful thing about hip hop is that you know, I mean, from the beginning, you know what I'm saying? It, it's been every. It's like it's always updated, and, and and people are able to put like their own twist to it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Like from 
you know, when cats were like heavily sampling jazz records, yeah, you know what I'm go. saying? Yeah, it goes so, through all these little phases. Yeah, all these phases. So, mm-hmm. nah, so, so that's ill. Yeah. Um, so, so you produced like a couple of tracks for Kanye. Uh, yes, sir. And the most interesting one was, well, the most interesting thing was uh, Can't Tell Me Nothing mm-hmm. that had like the Jeezy ad libs <laughs> in it. And so I always wondered, like, was that a Kanye and Jeezy song? Was that because I was always waiting originally, for Jeezy verse. <laughs> well, originally uh, the song come from Jeezy album from a song that I produced called I Got Money with Jeezy and Tip. Gotcha. And T.I. And so Kanye heard the album and was like, hey, man, that's really one of my favorite ones off that album. I would love to do a remix. And so first Kanye had got on it and Jeezy was like, huh, you know, his rap, you know, his words are a little bit different. You know, his is about getting money and we talking about we got money. So yeah, he just, you know, he wanted to put a twist to it. Mm-hmm. And so, um, and so he asked Jeezy, like, hey, man, where's the files to that song? And he was like, man, you're going to have to holler at Toomp on that, you know. Because he was like, yeah, man, I'm loving them drums. and I just want to build around them damn drums. So, and he remembered me from Trap Music. Because, mm-hmm. you know, Kanye had three songs on Trap Music album. Mm-hmm. And, um, and once Jeezy connected me and Ye, we started emailing each other files and whatnot, going back and forth. So mm-hmm. when Ye sent me the idea with the, oh, of my drums, I'm like, oh, that shit is wicked. Huh. And so I started hearing where the melody was going. I was like, okay, let me put my shit into it some more. And we just went on and on. And once they built around the strings and put the lady in there, and he put a whole, instead of a, being a remix, Jeezy wasn't really digging that, you know, the remix, especially with the, oh. Yeah. So Ye was like, hey, man, can I just make a song off of it? Jeezy was like, hell yeah, cool. Yeah. And there you go, can't tell me nothing. Man, Jeezy would have went off on that, though. Yeah, that's why he ended up getting on the remix, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. He caught the remix, but uh, yeah, he was right, one on one. So yeah. I, I had three on that graduation album. Yeah, um, Can't Tell Me Nothing, Good Life, and uh, the last one, Big Brother. Okay, yeah. Yep. Yeah, nah, man, and all of those songs are super impactful yeah, man. songs in hip-hop. Yeah, you know yeah. What thank I mean? you, thank but, you. Yes, sir. Yeah, nah, mm-hmm. I mean, how does that feel when... You know, because hip hop, a lot of times people try to put us in these boxes like to be regionalized. So people would try to, you know, put you in a box to maybe only uh, produce for Atlanta artists or (laughs) just do that sound. So how does it feel like when your sound is respected by artists of, you know, all, you know, creeds and and from all different places? Because that uh, uh, beautiful question, because I was raised of that. So back to the digging in the crates. I didn't know where none of those groups were from knew I was loving. I never knew that uh, the Osley Brothers were from T-Neck, New Jersey. <laughs> right. I just see T-Neck on the label, but I didn't know that was a city. Yeah. I just found that a shit out almost maybe eight years ago. That, was that T-Neck is a city. Yeah. In New Jersey. I just thought it was a record label, straight uh-huh. up, you know? And um, so you got to think, so, so for you think of Osley Brothers, Barry White, who was from California. Shit. Of course, Hamilton Bohannon was from Atlanta, Curtis Mayfield, Tennessee slash Atlanta. But a lot of the stuff that I was listening to and the lo- songs that I was singing as a kid, they, they were from all over the place. So my, my, my palette as far as, you know, um, audible, audible wise is like very broad, you yeah. know what I mean? So it's been that as a youngin since I was first started dropping the needle. So and that all that just flowed right into my production so basically that's why i was telling people like uh at one point they were like yeah took me you know you're a bass artist you know trap i'm like nah i'm beyond yeah. that yeah. just put me around the right artist you'll hear a whole nother side of me bro right yeah i'm making this because this is what y'all requested this is the cuisine y'all y'all want this italian food y'all want this particular dish yeah but whatever it is i can make it yeah because i grew up around all this shit and from being a dj mm-hmm. i play all these different type of music so it's easy for me to do that because I've studied all of them without knowing that I was studying them. Right. So, yeah, that's what makes it so easy to where I can just go to West Coast. You know, I can do the game, go to Texas, do the um, Slim Thug, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Um, Midwest, Bone Thugs and Harmony. I had one with them. So basically everybody in, the, in every region, I could, I could touch them, man, and, and, and none of them joints would sound alike. Right. You know, right. Nas. Yeah. Yeah. Now, interesting enough that you just said that none of them will sound alike. Um, 
I I feel like there isn't like a per se a, a tump sound like a hmm. like where if I hear one beat, I know that this is you versus hearing yeah. another one. Um, would would you agree with that, or are there sounds that you like do kind of use that might be even well, hidden in the background? It's you know? one sound that everybody try to tell me is the toot sound, and that's that cymbal ring, that ting, okay. ting, yeah. ting, ting. <laughs> and the first time I used that was on, uh, I think, "Look What I Got." Um, and then I started using it on a lot of other songs. That's like, yeah, from my own. Um, yes, that's that, that that ring cymbal, man. I mm-hmm. like from listening to soul records. You know, they used to do that. A lot of times, especially at the end of a song, that ding, ding. And so when I start putting that in about, after about a good five records back to back had that, people start saying that's the tomb sound. Yeah. I'm talking about even producers right now. Yeah. If I was sitting in a room with a producer, he was going through his beats. And before he matched play on maybe that third or fourth beat, he said, hey, man, I'm just going to let you know, man, there's some Toomp influence shit, man. I had to put that symbol in there. Yeah. And I'm like, you know what? Damn, that is, I, I, I go in and wear that jacket. Uh, that's the Toomp sound. You know yeah. what I mean? So. I would say, yeah, that's that's the only thing I could really identify. I would say somebody may be able to identify a tomb sound mm-hmm. sometime from the ring. Mm-hmm. And I got some people who say they can hear the way just how I do my drum program. And it's like the accent on the 808. Mm-hmm. Boom, 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 mm-hmm. boom. It ain't just that boom, 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 all in one velocity. It's like, yeah. you know, it's like low, soft. And it's a certain way. And that's what make the head bounce or whatnot. Mm-hmm. On you don't know me and a whole lot of other joints. You know what I mean? Word, so, word. I can yeah. dig it. And so you come, you, you come from an era where, you know, producers weren't really, weren't doing producer tags either. Um, so had you ever felt, you know, the need to put a producer tag on your beats, like in, in, in the latter years? Well, yeah. And the reason why, you know, I come from the era of just reading credits, you know, it's like I remember a while back before I knew his name was pronounced Kanye. I used to be like, man, whoever this Kane West dude, yeah. dude is, whoever this guy Bink is like, man, these dudes. You know, you see a person's name on an album like three or four times or more, you'd be like, oh, he must be next. You right, know what I mean? Right. And so it, it got to the point where people, you know, I, I'm like, okay. You know, I get a phone call. Hey, boy, man, I'm listening to such such an album. I see you got two of them on there. I see you got four of them on there. Because yeah. they reading the credits. Uh-huh. But, um, yeah, but after a while, you know, it was no more actual physical products. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it got to the point where like, oh, shit, I may have to use a tag. Yeah. But. I never really reached in that bag. I got a, I got a tag too. I Word. used that one from You Don't Know Me. It'd be like, uh, you know how when Tip say, I'm gonna keep on flossing pop as long as Toomp is on the beat. Yeah. So I got a slow version say, Toomp is on the beat, beat, uh. beat. So you might hear that on a few joints. Word. Uh, but I really didn't really break my neck to put no tag on there. Yeah. Uh, you know, if it's really necessary, I, I might, I may do it. You right. know, but. Um, Honestly, though, in this era, it may be necessary. I may have to do it more yeah. often, you know yeah. what I mean? But at the same time, I would love for it to just put a sound out there where they can say, oh, my God, who did that? Right. You know, I like that element of surprise, too. Yeah, no, you know? absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I love them phone calls. Man, man, I didn't know you did that shit. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, you no, know? for sure. Yeah, it's just a whole nother little, yeah. another feeling, you know? Yeah, it's tough because now that we don't have, like, the true physical credits, you're not opening something and reading mm-hmm. it, then it's like the one of the only ways to know is it, whether it's word of the mouth or the tag. Or the tag, you know yeah. So, so, yeah, there's a few joints I thought. I, I mean, I don't know. You might maybe go back to the tag. Word, I'll see word. if it's necessary. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. No, I can dig it. <laughs> uh, so, Tim, like, what, what you been working on lately? What you, um, what, what lately? you, what you got coming up? Shit, man, working on an instrumental album, which eventually going to have artists on it. You know, I figure I'd go on and crack that, crack that shit out first, you know, yeah. as far as just, man, honestly, I... Like track for track, beat for beat, there ain't too many people on this planet who can just go toe to toe with me. Just yeah. as far as the 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 verse, the the, the just broadness, as far as different genres. I'm talking about from dance to I still even got some Miami bass shit if somebody yeah. wanna go there on some twenty twenty three shit. Huh. You know, who would you um, want to go uh, in a in a producer versus with? Like who who, who would you, uh... <laughs> man? I was trying to get Drummer Boy to do that shit with me, man, because <laughs> yeah. uh, he got a nice catalog, bro. Mm-hmm. And you know, and just and some of the projects he's touched, you know, it's like I was like, you know what? I could see Drummer Boy. That'll be a good battle, yeah, you know. Yeah. And um, he was waiting for Swiss and them. I was like, man, let's do our own shit. We uh-huh. just call it something else. Yeah. Because I was like, man, Swiss and and uh, Timberland ain't checking for nobody else, man. Like, yeah. That'd be crazy, though. But they wasn't checking for nobody else. They, they went from producers 
and then started doing artists. The shit was more exciting yeah. when it was producers because it was taking you more of a, on a journey. You right, say, like, okay, right. you playing everybody you produce, so it's gonna be a variety of artists, right. songs being played. Right. And they missed out on so many producers. Then when I saw them come back around and do a Timberland and Swiss again, I was like, oh man, they ain't checking for us. Yeah, yeah. They don't want to see nobody. Yeah. Man, we got to make our own. We got to do our own. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? But and that was during COVID when nobody really had anything else right, to right, do. Right. So yeah, the excitement yeah. People is not really watching. But yeah, you know, yeah. me and Manny Fresh did that type shit first, though, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we had that, um, and Manny Fresh, that, that's another one. That's yeah, another man, Manny monster. Fresh, man. Oh, man, he a beast <laughs> with it. You know? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that's my guy. Word. But nah. Yeah, man. Um, but, yeah, and so, um, instrumental album, like I say, eventually start featuring albums on my, al on my instrumental albums, mm -hmm. featuring artists on my instrumental albums. Uh, I got a product called Stop Drunk. It's a first alcohol level reducer. Okay, I saw that yeah, on your Instagram. Yeah, man, you shake well, and, yeah, take one hit from that, man, and uh, it bring your alcohol level down within like 15, 20 minutes. Okay. Yeah, it's, it works, man. And, man, they um, need to start selling that at some bars or something. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah we, we, we've set up in a few spots, man, uh, to get the studies and set, popping out. We got folks who's interested in, um, you know, investing right. and whatnot. Yeah, so we still, we got a few of them on Amazon and Walmart Marketplace. Okay. And um, let me see, I just dropped the E-40 record. Well, E-40 just dropped the record I produced called Bands. Okay, yeah, that Bands um, record, yeah. Got another joint with 2 Chains, Wayne and Benny Butcher on the Collie Grove album. I got that's coming out. Um, shit, I might be in there with Sean Carter real soon. Just oh, getting nice. all my weapons together. Nice. Yeah, so he's yeah. working. I remember I was hyped when, uh, on that American Gangster uh, album when, when I saw that you had produced one on there back then. <laughs> and I was like, okay. That's what yeah, I'm that about. say hello. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. You know, yeah, I'm, so, I'm so glad I flew up to New York and, and got on that album, bro. Yeah. Because if I was waiting for the label to cut my check, I wouldn't have missed out on that. So oh, man. I had to dig into my own account and pay yeah. for, the, for, for everything. Yeah. So that shit yeah. was worth it. So, man, what are your thoughts on, um, you know, people selling, like, catalogs and all that? Like, that's, like, the big thing uh, these mm -hmm. days. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? And when I first those, heard about it. the producer stand in that? Because you see most artists selling their catalogs. Oh, Metro it's producers. Just... Yeah, it's, pro it's producers because mm -hmm. we're writers also. Right. You know what I mean? So, yeah, producers, songwriters. Um, when it comes to that, dog. For real, Spitty, I, I, I feel like it's two sides to it. One side, I would say, let's say I leave here tomorrow. You never know. I might choke. I don't eat chicken no more. I might choke off a chicken bone. But anyway, I may just leave here tomorrow. I have a 15-year-old daughter going on 16. And for her to live and to acquire her dad's royalties or whatnot, she wouldn't know the first person to call or anything. Right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I would, it would be great for my daughter just to know, hey, well, we forget trying to chase my dad checks. I know it's sitting in this account, so right. I got this card where I can go get whatever out of it. So yeah. that's the benefits of it. Yeah. And I'm thinking of it on that on that scale. Because a lot of people do are doing that to set up their estates and stuff like set that. Set it up. Yeah. It's for that, Absolutely. you know. Because you got to think, man. Uh, imagine my daughter or no, her mom or nobody else in my family would know the first step right. to do that. Guess what they would go to? An attorney. Hmm. And an attorney would charge the shit out of them and may fuck them in the middle of that. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Not physically, but y'all know what I mean. As far as fuck them around, as far yeah. as financially, and say, oh, yeah, well, this is what you're going to get. Next thing you know, he got them coming to his house mm -hmm. first. Mm -hmm. So you got that, but then you got cats like me who does a lot of research, and I understand business. I'm like, all right, man, y'all quick to give people 70 and 80 and close to 100 million for their catalog? Y'all must have done some hella research. It must about it. Something is about to change real soon. Right. And my plan is to live long enough to see that change and to benefit off that change. Yeah. So I still own all my shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? I've never done a pub deal ever. Like from the past, I've done an admin deal, but I always, all those are done. I've recouped. Right. So everybody made their money back. So I'm like a free agent now. Yeah. So yeah, definitely. I'm getting those calls and meetings or whatnot. Yeah. And, um, and that's cool, but um, it's like, from, from, from having money, you know what I mean? Like, 
I don't, I, I want to have a plan yeah. for that type of money. I don't want that type of money just sitting in my bank account. Right, right, absolutely. Because uh, tax, never, all that shit goes up with that, yeah, man. Sure. Like, so, you know, you got cash. Yeah, boy, we got to go get more jewelry, go to Icebox, give me another Ferrari, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, buy you some land and develop that land and do something. Because yeah. you got to no money. Nah, so I'm absolutely. hoping that a lot of these cats who, who are, are accepting those checks really understand finances. Yeah, no, nah, for sure. Because that shit, you... you Honestly, it's kind of like, it's like the lottery. Mm -hmm. There's the people who say, man, their life was a lot better before they, you know, they thought they was happy until maybe right. some years. Like, man, this shit that turned me into a beast. It enhanced my habits or whatever yeah. other little so shit they may have going it. on. Yeah, a lot of people lose it. Yeah. So, so like I say, the benefits is when you're thinking future-wise mm -hmm. as far as making sure that the folks, but then at the same time, I'm, never, I'm one of them cats who just, I'm, I'm gonna wait till the game flip because they're already speaking of how the royalty rates about to go up as far as the streaming and all that. Yeah. And now when you think of AI, <clears throat> excuse me, where it's going, now even before you get to the AI, the fact that music is now streamed and not physically distributed, right. dist distributed, it's like, now you could just hit enter and your music will hit or cover the whole globe at one time. Mm -hmm. So that's, that says a whole lot when you think of the value of our music and now you're starting to see more brands are using hip hop music right. to promote their brands, whether it's NFL, you know, you think about Super Bowl, man, you close your eyes, you're hearing a lot of hip hop on those commercials. Oh yeah, for sure. And shit, man, I done cleared 20 minutes. A lot minutes. of old school hip hop old too. Old school hip hop. I, I love seeing a lot of the uh, legendary artists, yeah. legacy artists getting paid. Yeah, you know? and a lot of these radio stations are starting to play more old school hip hop, yeah. you know? They getting away from a lot of this drill and spin the block, killer, killer music, yeah, you know? Yeah. Um, people going back to the shit that make them feel good and make mm -hmm. them want to dance, mm -hmm. you know? And not to shit on the new generation, but I hear a few of them that's cool, but a lot of that music is for, it really don't, you got the 808 in it, but it don't make people dance. Right. It don't send that feeling through you to make you just, hey, come on, oh shit, oh, that's my shit, oh! Right. Right. Yeah. You don't get that from this. Yeah, they, they, they play on the radio for a while, but they don't go but so far. You know, Grammys being one, they ain't really no top charting type artists. Mm -hmm. It's just enough for them to get about 50,000 a night. That's mm -hmm. cool. You know what I mean? Not to sit on them, but I would love to see people just enhance it a little bit. Yeah. Like, you know, sing more melodies, talk about something else different instead mm -hmm. of just, you know, drugs and spinning the block. Yeah. So my whole thing, I feel like, uh, the value of music, they, when the streaming came out and they took the physical away, they had us thinking that our music wasn't as valuable. Right. You know, this shit went from $8.99 per CD to $8 for a whole subscription of everybody that you want to hear. Yeah. So mentally, that'll make a writer slash producer feel like our shit is no longer valuable. Right. And then when so, you're making a fraction of a penny so, on each stream. Yeah. So all that. But me... I, I felt that way, but after I started doing my math, I'm like, oh, let me just make sure I register all my records. And when I did the math, I'm like, no, this one, this some good fucking money huh. right here. Yeah. And you see the momentum that is that's building up with the old school stuff from my catalogs. Like, come on, me and Tip just cleared 24s five times in two years. Huh. And that's just one song. Yeah. Wait till niggas start sampling motivation and you don't know me in the rest of the records. Right, right. And they still be used in movies and TVs right, and commercials. Right, right. I just cleared some of me and Luda, um, two miles an hour. That's supposed mm. to be on the new iPhone commercial. Okay. And GMC used it once before. Mm. So Tip, he, he, he holding on to his as well. Um, Luda holding on, like a few people holding mm. on to their catalog. You don't hear about Jeezy cutting no deals. Right, right. Honestly, I think a lot of us are businessmen. Not to say the other cats who are doing it not businessmen, right, right, but right. The, most of the people that you know that are businessmen, mm -hmm. You don't hear about them selling their catalogs too tough. Yeah. And hopefully they're the ones who are a start of business or turn into businessmen. Right. And, um, you know, when you get that money, just do the right thing with it. But if you're still out here trying to stand on the couch and see who jury can catch the most light nah, nah, <laughs> in the club and see who can have the fly shit in the parking lot, man, that ain't no reason to be selling your catalog, dude. Right, and right. You think you finna attract more women or whatnot? So yeah, for, for a seasoned veteran like myself, bro, that kind of money being wired to my account, man, I'm gonna be able to show you exactly what 
I'm finna do some shit downtown or something yeah. crazy, you know. Nah, that's real. Yeah. And, and talking about the uh, the streaming rates, uh, we see Snoop is going hard. Like he's going hard a, yeah. a, about, you know, like how the rates are too low. Yeah, it's how, getting better though. It's yeah. about to get better. Yeah, yeah and I, I'm glad he stood up for that because, mm-hmm. man, it got to the point where I don't know if you remember, but at one point I was uh, complaining about how artists are getting three hundred thousand a night are performing our music and writers and producers ain't getting nothing from it. Yeah, yeah. And they try to say that, yeah, you get performance royalties. No, we don't. Mm-hmm. Well, how the hell they go on tour and get two, three hundred a night and we don't get nothing from that? Huh. Period. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's real. <laughs> like, and I was trying to push a, uh, 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 I was called, I called it the Davis Act, mm-hmm. 2019, because 2019 is when I had the idea. Well, I brought the idea earlier than that, but 2019 is when I started being more vocal about mm-hmm. it. And, um, a lot of people got quiet. A lot of people were like, man, you gonna mess up the relationship between rappers and, you know, the artists and producers. I was like, man, somebody need to ruffle this shit up. Yeah. Because right now, I know a lot of people don't know, which is really fucked up, and I got to look into the camera on this one. It's a thing called sound exchange. Mm-hmm. So you know about that, right? Yeah. So in order for me to receive, or any producer or writer to receive anything from Sound Exchange, to you have to go back and re-register those songs, but guess what? The artist got to approve that. Hmm. For some reason, they got all the leverage. So if I wanna um, register those Kanye records, I got to catch up with Kanye, and he got to give me the okay. Wow. Tip got to give me the okay. So everybody I produce are in a position to where they got the last say-so to where if I'm gonna get my sound exchange check Mm -hmm. and man a lot of them just ain't that friendly bro and we talking about a good maybe 500k maybe sitting over there from each producers or more wow but yeah so that's uh that's something that a lot of people just finding out this year Mm -hmm. is that you know they thinking they they get a sound exchange but then later on you find out that yeah you that artist got to approve that and so you just got to hope that them motherfuckers wake up feeling good that day and say all right i I'll let Toomp get that or I yeah. let Charlotte Red get that. Yeah. Or I let Metro get that. Yeah, that's that's, that's where we are right now. Yeah. I don't know how they were able to have that much control of that, but yeah, that it's, it really it's in their hands. So your fate still kind of lies like in the hand of the artist to a certain degree. And yeah. once again, man, y'all need getting two, three hundred a night, man. Let us get that, bro. Hmm. Let us get that sound exchange, man. Yeah. Go on and check that off, bro. Let nigga get that. Yeah, nah, that's real. That's real. Yeah. Yeah. So um, with uh. We, we, you mentioned AI. Um, if Timberland uh, gets this whole AI technology that he's trying to get approved where he wants to be able to produce over a dead MC's vocals, mm-hmm. would, you, would you produce uh, for, 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 for a dead artist? Psh. Would you produce a song with a dead artist's vocals on it? Well, I'm gonna tell you, man, believe it or not, when I first saw Timberland do that, I didn't even think of a dead artist. Mm. I thought of an alive artist that just don't fuck around no more. Mm. Three stacks. Oh, wait. <laughs> yeah, that, that would be crazy. Honestly, to this day, I would love to just kidnap Andre right now for about <laughs> two weeks and be like, man, go in that booth, man. Yeah. I'm going to play you about 80 beats, bro. And whatever come to your head, you just let that shit loose. And I do all the editing. You can go back and play your flute. You can fly back to Cali. But boy, as long as I got this shit on this Pro Tools, man. I'm gonna get back with you and I'm gonna send it to you and let you approve it before it comes out to the public. Yeah. So the whole thing about AI and what people are afraid of, I think they just thinking like, oh man, they go, they stealing our shit. Well, this is a time to where you start putting, it's new laws have to be put in place. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And we've been going off this same format paper, paperwork wise for a long time. And now that streaming has changed, now the contracts have changed, see, and that's what happened too. Mm-hmm. Just like the Royal, the sound exchange thing. That's not in, the, a lot of that stuff was co- covered in the contracts back mm-hmm. then. Mm-hmm. But now that's being something new. That's not, co- that wasn't covered in the contract that we did back in 07 to 2010 or whatnot. Mm-hmm. Cause that's new. And that's why the artists got to approve that. So I think now that we see that where, where it's going mm-hmm. to where you can just tell this AI, hey, give me, Biggie's voice, give me a DJ Toon track, give me a Metro Boomer, give me a Shawty Red type of drums. The fact that you can, that you have to make that request, I think there should be a system to where I would be paid immediately. When somebody say, give me a DJ Toon type mm-hmm. feel, mm-hmm. 
that shit's supposed to be in a database where it's automatically come to me. I don't right, know what right, my right. breakdown would be, but long as I'm getting something and it'll keep up with just me knowing who's using my shit. So that's why when people say, hey, man, this AI may get out of line to where somebody could disguise their voice as mine and have this person thinking that they talking to me. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to have the database, or they should have the database to where they'll know who's using your voice. Mm. So if somebody's trying to get to your kid using your voice or to your, tell your right, wife right. something crazy, it should be ready to say, hey, well, Mr. such and such from Indiana used yeah. that. Right, yeah. They use that same type of footprint and like how they use to like track everything on to YouTube. Where, yeah, if somebody downloads yeah. some child porn or some shit, so the same way right. that you would be able to find that, you would be able to know who trying to use their voice to get my banker to sign this account over, yeah. it should show who's using this shit. And that yeah. way you'll know who's using it and you'll know that that you have some, should have a mail, uh, envelope coming in the mail or whatnot, right. which AI with mail night it might even be around no more either. Yeah. So, and for this thing, and yeah, I, I figure as long as when you when you programming this thing and when you making that request and whatever that request is, that that it, we, who should be paid for that? So if you say I want to use Biggie voice, yeah, Biggie kids should be eating off that. Mm. Whoever owns his estate right. should be eating off that. Right. You know, and if you make that request. Mm -hmm. Now, if you just happen to sound like Biggie, there's nothing that you can do about that. But if you tell this AI, hey, give me this, and you name that person or whoever that is, mm -hmm. yeah, man, they should eat off that, bro. Right. And my whole thing is, you got to think, shit, the beginning of AI was really when the damn, um, when the workstation came about, the Rolling Phantoms and, oh, the, Rolling yeah. tr and the Tritons and whatnot. The whole band is in there, the oh. horn section, yeah. the bass guitar player. And that's when musicians start feeling like, damn, man, how you, whoa, we just sitting over here like chopped liver. Huh, yeah, yeah. What? You mean, I'm saying, you saw the reaction of some of them OG, man, hold on, you mean tell me that thing got horns too? <laughs> God damn, man, what are we going to do with us? Right. And that's how they felt. Huh. And boom, all of a sudden, think about how technology changed when the Rolling Phantoms and those started being, uh, like people wasn't really using them anymore because right. they start going to the laptops yeah, yeah. and you start and getting PCs a bigger sound. All that, uh, yeah. yeah. So now on the laptop, you getting way 10 times more than what was in this damn keyboard. Right, right. So that's just, you have to, so I'm, I'm, I'm embracing every stage yeah. of evolution okay. of that's this shit. Right. I get it. Yeah. And so now this new way of AI, it's going to be a new way of, of creating music. Now I'm going to be like, yo, you know, give me the stream section, uh, play this. And play a melody. I'm telling AI, and it's gonna mimic whatever I'm telling it right. to where I ain't even got to program this shit no more. Yeah. It's just gonna be able to speak that, right. and it'll play it. And so, and I mean, yeah, I, 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 my goal is just uh, shit, stay healthy and live long enough to be able to watch that part too. I watch, watch the game go from eight tracks to albums to cassettes to CDs. You know what I mean? I was watching, I saw the first, VH, first VHS player come into play in 1981. You yeah. know what I mean? So I'm just thankful to be born in 69, bro, right. to watch all this, you know, these different things evolve. Yeah. So when it comes to AI and the music game, man, as long as we lock in on it and, 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 and get everything in place legally to make sure that our asses are covered financially and just, you know, the way we, we ain't feeling like we getting robbed, Man, come on, that's, 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 where, that's where it is. What you and, think Siri is? Right, right, true that. And have you always embraced technology like that? Yes, like I when have. we were coming from CDs into MP3s and yes. that transition, you were, mm -hmm. you were with that? Okay. Mm -hmm. right. Only thing I didn't that I, um, I embraced the technology itself. Only thing that I may have had a problem with is from the non talented people being able to use that and flex like they the shit. Right, right. To where, right. When it, you know, because being a DJ, you know, that, that required knowing how to mix, mm -hmm. how to blend records, and know how to read a crowd, and knowing how to, you know, just work the equipment. Mm -hmm. But then when it came to the point to where it was just a computer with a little DJ program in it, yeah. that's when you had the Paris Hiltons and all these celebrities start calling themselves DJs with no DJ experience. Yeah. So when I see that type of shit happen, and then sometimes with the AI now, you got people who may not be musically inclined. Mm -hmm. But one thing you would say with a guy who may have FL is when he's clicking those notes, he does have some type of knowledge of what it's supposed to sound like. Mm -hmm. 
That way when he hit play, it sounds amazing. Mm -hmm. Because he locked those, he might didn't play that out originally, but he knew like do 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 do. Okay, you you know some you have you you have your ears are trained in some type of way to where you know yeah. how to program this. But now you got programs where you don't even have to have a ear for music. You can be tone deaf and just tell it to do whatever, and it sound you sound like the new guy on the block. Yeah. But eventually that'll be exposed somewhere, especially you know if you really are not that dude it'll come out it, either in an interview hey man so how did you come up with the melody on such and such man i just clicked the buttons oh okay right. but you ask me how something came together man i played this and i brought this guitar player in and yeah 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 and so that's why when you think about it that's why everybody want to go analog now mm. because it's getting to the point to where AI, like I say, is, is evolving in, in, in certain things and as far as technology and how things come together. But when you get to the analog world, that shit still separate the men from the boys. Mm. And that's why, that's why now people still can holler at cats like me and other producers who physically are doing this shit mm -hmm. for real, who you can walk in and watch them really put this shit together for real. Yeah. You know, the cats who just really clicking and you know, ain't really doing nothing, you know. Not to take anything away from them, they got some cool beats, but their process is not nothing to write, write home about. Mm, yeah. You know, yeah. if they do any type of workshop, and they just click and see my workshop, I'm gonna show you how to MIDI, I'm gonna show you how to run these together, and I'm gonna tell you how this play, and mm. you know what I mean? But somebody who's just clicking, you know, it, it, the beat might be interesting, but the process is not interesting. Right, right. And people like to see the process, nah, man. Nah, for sure. You know, sure. Pimp My Ride, you know, the home shows. People love, before, after, yeah, you know, absolutely. makeover yeah. shows. You watching somebody cook a meal. People like, love to you watch people. See they all people, the steps yes. Of it. You don't so want to see it going forever, people are going. gonna love the process. Yeah, you know absolutely. what I mean? So that that's that's never gonna go anywhere. So you just got to keep the process interesting, mm -hmm. and that's our job to keep that shit interesting to where it's entertaining. Right. Yeah. Yes, sir. Absolutely, man. Tump, you uh, you got any, you got any last words for the uh, for the fans? Anything last else words we got out there? Well, man, listen, y'all. Felt like hip hop was feel like it, it's like uh, we had a little lightweight standstill. But one thing I must shout out: these new female rappers. Ooh, wait, they kill ladies, the guy. queens. Y'all keep that shit going. You know what I mean? Um, and I'm glad to see uh, uh, women like Megan. You know, she changed her image. You know, she felt like at one point every time the camera touched her, she had to just keep shaking her ass. But now I'm seeing how she's carrying herself. She real slick with it, man. Mm -hmm. She got a whole new look. Yeah. She carrying herself like like a young lady. Yeah, and she no. can still be a rapper and do that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So you got a few of them who, uh, some of the new female rappers, now they understand that it ain't all about twerking right. to get that attention now. Because people starting to really respect the art again. Yeah. You know, the real craft of this shit. And um, not to take anything from the males in hip-hop, but man, man, it's, it's time for us to, um, if we going to, from this being has been a male driven game, we're gonna have to really step in and sit behind that driver's seat and do something new. And stop talking about spinning the block on every record and just shoving something down a woman's throat and what you gonna do. Like, man, just start making good music again. Yeah. You know what I mean? You know, um, let's get back to it, bro. Because right now it seems like it's lost. So R&B really been, been, been my shit lately. Word. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and I, I, I love hip hop and I produce I make hip hop tracks every day. I make R&B tracks as well. But it's right now, it just seems like it's at a standstill. That's why there ain't really too many albums out. A lot mm -hmm. of albums are coming out unnoticed. Yeah. You know what I mean? Shout out to Lil Baby. I love all his work. But that last album he put out, not to say it was whack. Yeah. It just went unnoticed. Yeah. He, he ain't been able to bounce back from, you know, the whole statement that he made that triggered the, the, the LGBTQ. Yeah, community. that too. But you got to think, who's really has... You know what I mean? Because now when albums come out, it's like they don't last. I don't know what the hell it is. I'm trying to figure it out. Yeah. See, I don't know. I wonder if it's the attention span or the lack of promotion. Because now when albums come out, man, people might listen to them shit for about seven days, maybe a week. Yeah. Next thing you know, it's gone. That last Jeezy album, yeah. the last um, um, uh, Chris Brown album. Yeah. That man had about 17 records on there, man. People talking about that album for about, about a week or two. Yeah. And it just... It's so much music coming out that I think that is, 
it's kind of hard to like just just keep up, you know, with it all. And if it's not, but, but if all the music that's coming out, a lot of the good shit still kind of go unnoticed. That's yeah. what's scary. Yeah. You know what I mean? You got uh, on, on the R&B side, you got cats like Lucky Day, right? Yeah. And a few other, you know, um, you know, uh, what's the girl? Her. You know, she get she get her um, her fair um, amount of marketing and promotion. Um, what's the other girl named Sizz? Um, yeah, yeah, Sizzle. Sizzle, like, I'm glad to see that she's getting hers because if she if they weren't careful, whoever's behind her, that could have went unnoticed too. As yeah. dope as her shit is, so it's like now in music, I'm uh, I think y'all, it's just time for us to really start to come up with some new with some new type of promotion and marketing schemes, if we have to call it. Yeah. To really push our music because we no longer have the 106 in parks mm -hmm. to where you can sit on the couch and talk about your album and who's produced it, who's right. featured. Right. Like the setup used to be the shit back in the 90s and early 2000s. Right. right. You know, there's no show right now. Do we can watch our artists perform live? Hmm. At least we had Showtime at the Apollo. Right. We had Arsenio. Right. We had 106 in Park. We had Video Vibrations. Right. And these rap city, they're going there and rap live where you know your, your favorite rapper can rap for real. Yep, There's yep. no type of platforms out here or no type of anything that set artists up the way they used to. Yeah. And so that's why now it's kind of like, what's going to be that next thing to really break your artists? Is it a package that you got to put together or we just got to come with a new TV show? Hmm. Like what the hell is it going to take? Right, because right. like you say, it's a lot of music coming out, but it's, a lot of it is just going unnoticed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we got to figure that out, man. If we, you know, our culture, I don't know if we, we don't own enough TV networks. What the hell is it? You know, let's put that money together. All the ones who done got they, uh, sold their catalogs. All right, let's put that money together and see what we can own to keep this shit going to yeah. where we can continue eating. But right now, it seems like it's slowly fading away. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see what happens. Uh, there's this bid and war going on for BET right now. So it'd be interesting to see what happens with whoever's able to acquire that to see if they're able to and take who, that network whoever back. Whoever acquire that, and, 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 but if they continue letting BET run the way it's been running for the past 10, 12 years, it's... it's if it's, 50 Cent get it, it I don't make. think he'll let it do that. But see, if 50 do it, yeah, from him still loving music, he may come up with something, mm -hmm. yeah, with, with that. But if, um, but, if, if, but if just the network people like a Tyler Perry, he may do it just for the film and TV right. shows, but right. yeah, I would love for a music head, uh, somebody like 50 who's yeah. uh, in the gray area with that on the TV mm -hmm. and still an artist, Absolutely. still love performing, still love hip hop. Yeah. You know, that, that, it'll be great to see it in his hands, mm -hmm. you know. Or even if it's um, all them brothers were to get together, but just put somebody in the leading, you know, in a, to handle certain divisions of right. it. Okay, Tyler, you got this side of it. 50, you got this side, okay. Tyler, you gonna have these for the for the church people that, that show, you know, whatever, uh, you know. Some people say he be male bashing, black male bashing. Right. But fifty, when it comes to this gutter hip hop shit, for the music and some of these, you know, hustling mm -hmm. series and documentaries, we gonna have you do that. And all that can be funneled through BET if they do it the right way. But it could easily be done the wrong way too. You know what I mean? Sure Especially that. if they, um, if it ain't enough of us in here. Yeah. Because it's owned by white folks now, right? Yeah, yeah. Vibe. Yeah, so I would love to see what happened, man, when we get a hold to it. And it would be a great chance to see if we could really, if we could really hold our shit down the way we always say. You know? Right. A lot of people say they want to buy NFL and, right. and basketball teams, but I, I would love to see if we could really hold on to that shit and do it the right way. Yeah. You know, so I'm, I'm, interested, I'm interested to see when, um, when they finally let one of us buy a team. And wanna, I would love to see if motherfuckers can handle that in a good way would they take it to another level or would it drop down right yeah. hopefully it would take it to a whole nother level you yeah. know what i mean yeah. nah, for like sure. i say man as long as they paying folks like me 500k a year bro i keep all the athletes straight come on let them sit with me for about a month uh -huh. let's put that together yeah <laughs> <laughs> yes sir yes sir all right bro we yeah good. i'll let yes, you man yeah all right what you do about that what you do about that what you do about that